All right, so you've added these to your notes. One additional piece of information that I want to include with this is you'll notice that the degrees here only go up to 5. So then what happens if it's 6 or 7 or 8? Anything higher than 5, the name we would give it is degree whatever. So like if it's degree 6, we just actually say the words degree 6. Um, one or zero through five comes up often enough where having a word dedicated to it and that we all remember is worth it. But anything past six doesn't come up often enough really to just say, okay, it's worth memorizing these unique names for each one. Along with those, we are going to be also classifying by these. So go ahead and add these to your notes as well. And then we're going to start seeing how we actually apply these things together. Now there is one other little detail I want to give you about these particular terms. Like in the last one, it only went up to a certain amount. In this set of definitions, in terms of specific types of polynomial, we only go up to three terms. What happens if it's four terms? What do we say? Well, if it's four terms, it's a polynomial. All of these are polynomials. But anything that's four or more we're really just going to call it a polynomial. So let's say it was four terms. You describe that as a polynomial of four terms. Yes, we do need to be specific in terms of how many terms there are because we're still specifying that. It's just we don't have to memorize some special word like quadnomial or something like that. that we just do not go into that. So we're going to practice classifying polynomials, and we're going to start together by doing these three. And so we're going to classify each polynomial by its degree and number of terms. Degree is the first set of notes you took. Number of terms is the second set of notes you took. For the moment, write down each of these three problems, and then we'll classify them together so you can be adding that to the problems on your own paper. All right, so... Let's go ahead and classify these. Now, the first thing we classify by is degree. So in order to classify by degree, we're doing number one here. We say, what is the degree? Remember, degree is just a fancy mathematical word for the highest exponent. So the highest exponent in number one is three. So you look back at your notes, and you say, okay, if it's degree three, what do we call it? And in your notes, you should then find that degree three is called cubic. So that's classifying by degree. Now we need to classify by number of terms. So now we count the number of terms. Now terms are separated by addition and subtraction. So in this problem, we have two terms. So if there are two terms, what do we call that? Binomial. Binomial. So number one is a cubic binomial. We're going to approach the others the same way. We start by figuring out what's the degree. So in the case of number two, what is the degree of that polynomial? And again, that means what is the highest exponent. And so in the case of number two, our highest exponent here is two. Now, typically the highest exponent will be first, but that's not always the case. So you still need to check the rest. So if it's degree two, what do we call it? Quadratic. Quadratic, absolutely. And how many terms are there in number two? Three. three terms. And if there's three terms, what do we call it? Trinomial. Trinomial. So number two is a quadratic trinomial. And then number three. Number three is a little bit tricky because it can be simplified. Notice in number three, there's a couple like terms. I have a 4x and I have a minus 4x. Well, if I go ahead and do that subtraction, 4x minus 4x, that ends up being 0. So if I simplify this, really I find that this whole thing just equals negative 7. We always have to classify it based on what it simplifies to. Because there can only be one classification for any given polynomial. So, I'm now classifying negative 7. 
So first up, we need to figure out what's the degree of the polynomial. What is the degree of negative 7? Well, degree is the highest exponent, but I see no exponent. In fact, there's not even an x there. If the x is totally gone, that means our degree is 0. So this one's degree 0. And degree 0 is constant. Which, by the way, kind of makes sense in terms of the language used here, I hope. Because if this whole thing equals negative 7, no matter what you say x equals, it's always going to equal negative 7. It equals a constant value. That's why it's called constant if it's degree 0. And how many terms are there in this problem? One term. And so this one is a constant monomial. So then having done those last three, hopefully you kind of got a feel for what these things look like and feel like when classifying. I want you to do the same classifying with these three. And again, write down the original problem and the classification. And as you go, after you've had a chance to answer each one, we'll talk through each one as well. All right, so for number four, we first need to get our degree. Remember, that's the highest exponent. In the case of number four, our highest exponent here is seven. It's not at the start in this case. It's in the middle. We, that's why we got to check all of them. So this one's degree 7. Degree 7 is just degree 7. There's no special fancy name for that one. And how many terms are there? Well, terms are separated by addition and subtraction, so there's three of them. Which means it is a degree 7 trinomial. Alright, number 5 now. First up, by degree. What is the degree in number 5? 3. And so degree 3 is called cubic. Yep, so this one's cubic. And then how many terms are there? 4 terms. And anytime it's 4 terms or more, we just say it's a polynomial of 4 terms or whatever the number of terms is. So this one's a cubic polynomial of 4 terms. On number 6, in order to do that one, Start by simplifying, because you'll notice there are some like terms that we can combine here. Uh, specifically, I got 3x to the ninth here, and I got minus 3x to the ninth there. So if I combine those two, 3x to the ninth minus 3x to the ninth is 0. That just went away. Okay, then we look to combine terms on the rest. I have a negative 6x to the fifth and a positive 2x to the fifth. So negative 6x to the 5th plus 2x to the 5th is negative 4x to the 5th. And then the plus 4x squared, there's no other x squared terms that that can combine with, so it's just going to stay a plus 4x squared. Now that we've simplified it, we can classify it. Always start by simplifying. Alright, so at this point now, we say what's the degree? In this case, our highest exponent is 5, so this is degree 5. And remember, degree 5 is called quintic. So this is going to be a quintic. How many terms? Two terms. Binomial. And two terms is binomial. binomial. So this one is a quintic binomial. So uh, now we're going to be getting into a little bit of graphing. So Take out that graph paper yeah. and set up two graphing grids. At least negative 10 to 10 yeah. will suffice on each graphing grid. <laughs> so this unit that we're going into is dealing with all sorts of different types of polynomials. And we have done a lot of graphing with different types of polynomials, specifically quadratics we spent quite a bit of time on. Uh, in this unit, there's one main polynomial graph that you will need to worry about learning, and that's y equals x cubed. And so this is the first one we're going to graph. We're going to graph this parent function. Write the equation down, y equals x cubed, above your first graphing grid. And in the past, when we've started a new graph, we've tended to just make a table so that we could see where the points are. And we're basically going to be using that same method here, except 
I'm not actually going to write out the formal table. We'll just be calculating those points and then plotting them immediately. So the first x value I want to try, and I'm going to get them just by plugging them in for x. I'm going to try 0 because it's a great starting point. So then, if I plug 0 in for x, that means I'm doing 0 cubed. What is 0 cubed? Zero. Well, 0 times 0 times 0, yeah, that's just 0. So that means if x is 0, y is 0. So we have the point 0, 0. All right, let's go over to 1 now. If x is 1, plug 1 in for x there, so we're doing 1 cubed. What is 1 cubed? Well, that's 1 times 1 times 1, which is 1. So that gives us the point 1, 1. All right, now let's go to x being 2. I'm plugging 2 in for x up here, so that means I'm going to be doing 2 cubed. What is 2 cubed? 8. It is 8, yeah, because we're doing 2 times 2 times 2. So 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, so we got the point 2, 8. What about if x is 3? What's 3 cubed? 27. Yeah, because 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27. That one's definitely off my graphing grid. Now, if you happen to make your graphing grid go out to 27, by all means, plot it. <laughs> I didn't. So I'm going to call that good. I don't need to go any bigger than that because I know nothing else on that side is going to fit on my graphing grid. I do need to check and see what's happening to the left of 0, though. So let's plug in negative 1. So if I do negative 1 cubed, and I actually want to write this out because I want you to see why it ends up being what it is because this might help avoid some issues later. So negative 1 cubed means negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1. Well, negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. And then I'm going to multiply that by the other negative 1. So y equals negative 1. So the big thing I want you to note here is that when we cube a negative, we get a negative. Oh boy. Different from when we squared it, right? Because remember, anytime you squared a negative, you got a positive. But when you cube a negative, you get a negative. So in this case, we got negative 1, negative 1. Plot that point. And then let's go to negative 2. What's negative 2 cubed? Well, negative 2 cubed, will that be a positive or a negative number? Negative. Okay, and what was 2 cubed? 8. So negative 2 cubed must be a negative 8. And similarly, if I did negative 3 cubed, I'd end up with negative 27. And once again, that's off my graphing grid, so I'm not going to worry about plotting that. Why is it so loud? Why they get, like, fix that noise? All right, so um, make sure each of those points is plotted big and clear so that when you draw the curve through, you'll be able to see it still because we didn't actually write out a table, so this is going to be your table of values plotted there. Before I draw on that curve, though, I want to take a closer look at what's happening around zero because right now it looks like we might just be kind of going straight through it, and we aren't. So let's actually take a closer look here and see what is happening. So, let's take one half. If x is one half, what's one half cubed? Well, remember to cube a fraction, you cube the top and cube the bottom. So one cubed is one over two cubed. What's two cubed? Eight. So one half cubed is one eighth. That'd be like there. And of course, negative one half would give us a negative one eighth. Notice those things are really getting very close to the x-axis very quickly. The upshot of this and practicality when we go to graph it is that our graph actually is leveling out here at zero before it switches directions. So when you go to draw that graph in, you need to make sure that it's flattening out at zero. This then is what that graph should come out looking like when you look at the whole picture. 
Make sure that you have those points plotted and connected accurately according to this. Now, having seen this graph, this is the graph of the parent function. You can now take this graph and modify it according to the same patterns that we've seen with all the other graphs we've done this year. We can shift it, we can stretch it, we can reflect it. And in terms of the equation itself, they all follow the same rules. So, on that second axis, set of axes that you set up, All right, so let's see how we do make that graph then. The minus 4, it's in with the x. And anytime it's in with the x, it moves it in the x direction. Specifically in this case, it's going to move it right 4. Then the minus 1 hanging on the end, it's going to move it down 1. So after we move it right 4, we're going to move it down 1. That is going to give us our first point. So we plot the point at 4, negative 1. That's the point that's normally at 0, 0. So that's that point where it's going to be flattening out. We can now plot all the other points relative to that. Like if I go over 1, I'm going to go up 1 cubed, which remember was 1. If I go over right 2, I'm going to go up 2 cubed, which was 8. So I go right 2 and up 8 from that first point. A little note there when you go up 8, make sure you're counting up by 8 from the starting point. You're not going up to 8, you're counting up by 8. Then we do the same thing on the left side, so we go left 1, down 1, and we go left 2, down 8 as well. Plot each of those points. Make sure that each of those points is clearly labeled, easy to see that there's actually a point there, so that when you draw the graph through, it's easy to tell where those points were. That way, if you look back at this later, it's a lot easier to follow with those points on there than if you just have the curve like this.